From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Welcome to Washington Watch. Well, coming up on this Tuesday edition, the House of Representatives is now wasting no time moving forward on their conservative agenda. Last night, the House adopted the rules that will govern the 118th Congress, rules that devolve power from the House Speaker to members of the House. This was the result of last week's negotiations over the Speaker's election, which we discussed quite a bit. Of course, the left, ah, they're not happy. After a week of chaos, we now have a rules package for mega extremists attacking our freedoms and every major responsibility of this body, from paying America's bills to funding our government. To giving the American people power, the ability to govern themselves and chart their own future. Wow, radical ideas. That was Washington State Congresswoman Jaya Paul. Well, we'll be joined in just a moment by the new House Republican leader, Steve Scalise, and we'll talk about the agenda and the way forward. Also coming up. The president inherited a mess because of what the last administration did. They inherited, a, we inherited a mess. And, uh, you know, Republicans in Congress made it worse by blocking comprehensive immigration reform. How in the world they do that with a straight face escapes me. I have no idea. That was White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre defending President Biden's two-year delay and getting to the border. Must have been on Southwest Airlines. Well, what can we expect to come from his border visit? We're actually going to talk about that with the former Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, a little bit later. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was sworn in as governor of Arkansas today, and lawmakers there are wasting no time and taking on the left. We're going to talk with Arkansas State Representative Mary Bentley a little later. And South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham will join us later to discuss life in the post-Roe world. The word for today comes from Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Now, Isaiah is not talking about a government program. He's talking about salvation. It's free cannot be purchased, nor can you work for it. You must simply accept it. Now, this is hard for many to grasp, so they pay for empty alternatives that do not and cannot satisfy. But there is a catch. It is only for those who are thirsty. You must want what the Lord is offering, righteousness that brings reconciliation with God our Maker. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you thirsty? He will satisfy. To find out more about our Bible reading plan, go to frc.org slash Bible. With the Speaker of the House impasse resolved, House Republicans went to work yesterday quickly adopting the new rules package negotiated during the Speaker election process last week. Now, these rules create a more transparent process that will allow Republicans to curb spending, confront Democrats regarding the debt limit, and investigate the abuses of the Biden administration. Now, this also paves the way for Republicans in the House to immediately move meaningful legislation forward. Week one, this week, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, a measure that Nancy Pelosi and her party blocked 80 times. What other measures will we see in the coming days from the Republicans in the House? Join me now to discuss this, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise. He serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committees as well. He represents the 1st Congressional District of Louisiana. Congressman Scalise, welcome back to the program. Hey, Tony, it's great to be back with you and especially good to be back in the majority with Nancy Pelosi fired. Well, let me congratulate you on your new position as the House Majority Leader. Um, You've already announced the agenda moving forward, and I want to get to that. But first, I, I want you to touch on the new House Rules package that was passed last night. There were some doubters, but Speaker McCarthy delivered. The leadership followed through on what they committed to last week. Why is this so important? Yeah, Tony, why this is so important, and you saw the debate last week, is the debate that's been going on for a few months now, is Washington is broken. Uh, it's fundamentally broken. We needed to change the way that Washington works to empower members of Congress to actually fight for the people 
who are struggling out there, standing up against so many of these far left radical agenda items that have created all the inflation, the energy costs, an open border. And so we had a lot of back and forth conversations with members how best to do it. But frankly, this is a debate that's been years in the making. I think people who watched last week were encouraged that they heard real debate on how Washington should work better. And, you know, the Democrats were going nuts. The left was going nuts, as was the media because they knew this meant that their party was over. These you know, thousands of pages of bills, of omnibus spending bills, $1.7 trillion, dropped by dark of night, voted on the next day where nobody has a chance to read it, all kind of unrelated items that have nothing to do with basic government funding. That's the kind of stuff people have been sick of for a long time, Tony. And we had to get the rules right, and we spent a few days to do it, uh, but ultimately, spending a few days to fix what's broken with Washington so that we can spend the next two years fighting so that Washington can stand up for the people who are struggling across America is refreshing. It's something that needed to happen a long time ago, and I'm glad we got it done and passed last night. I want to play a clip of uh, the minority leader, Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, He had this remark uh, this weekend. Play clip number three. And while the Congress was held captive this particular time, uh, what is going to be a problem is if the American people will be held captive over the next two years to the extreme MAGA Republican agenda that apparently has been negotiated into the House rules and the functioning of the Congress. Uh, Steve, you set the agenda as the, the, the Republican leader. You've already put out there, before we even had the debate last week over the speaker, what the priorities were going to be. Uh, Is this MAGA Republican agenda? It's an agenda that the American people supported Republicans and put them in charge to carry out. Yeah, in fact, you know, if anybody was held hostage, it was families who were watching every month with crushing trillion dollar bills here and trillion dollars uh, bills there, uh, money borrowed from China, uh, tax increases, regulations, open borders, Uh, families paying more at the grocery store for everything, higher energy costs. That's what's been crushing families. And it's the left who did it, the extremists on the far left, President Biden, Nancy Pelosi on down. And look, they're going to kick back. I can understand, you know, when when the, the American people finally rejected that far left extremist ideology and said, we want Republicans to have the majority in the House to finally stop this madness. I can understand that these far leftists are going to push back. But you know what? We're going to push back, too. Because we're fighting for those families who have been left behind. But, but they also benefit from the rules themselves by having a more open process. So I'm not quite sure what they're complaining about when they talk about these new rules. These new rules take the power from the speaker, which Nancy Pelosi grabbed for herself, and it, it devolves to the individual members. Yeah, and, and this really gets to the heart of the differences between conservatives and, and big government socialists. They want power centralized. They wanted all the power bottlenecked into Nancy Pelosi's office, where again, multi-thousand page bills were written by dark of night. You know, you remember Obamacare, the infamous, you gotta pass the bill to find out what's in it. We found out what's in it. Uh, It's things that dramatically increase costs on families. It denied healthcare to millions of people who had plans that they liked. You know, if you like your plan, you can keep it. That promise and lie was broken to so many people. And so changing that relationship between Washington and the rest of America has needed to happen for a long time. And that's what the rules package does. If Democrats want to be a part of helping fix the problems they created, they now have the ability to file amendments too. You know, but we were shut out of the process. You talked about the Born Alive Act at the outset. And Tony, this is a bill that you've helped lead on to raise public awareness nationally. And Wagner's bill where we tried over and over again, like you said, 80 times Nancy Pelosi said no. And so we weren't able to bring a bill that says if a baby's born alive outside the womb, you can't kill that baby and call it abortion. It's murder. And yet now we're finally bringing that bill to the House floor tomorrow. We'll have a vote. I hope every Democrat votes for it. They should. But frankly, whether they vote for it or not, we're going to pass that bill. We're going to fight for those those unborn. We're going to fight for 
our most vulnerable, and we're going to actually give a voice to members of Congress who have been shut out of this process for way too long. And it, it shows a stark contrast between the priorities of the two parties, uh, that Nancy Pelosi wouldn't even allow a vote on this over 80 times. But also last night, one of the first bills that you voted on uh, pertained to the IRS and the fact that they're uh, putting 87,000 agents out there. And, and it's interesting, data now come to the forefront that if you're in the lower uh, lower econo economic income uh, status, you're five times more likely to be audited. Is, is that what the Biden administration wants to further harass hardworking men and women? Yeah, and then look, this was their agenda from day one. When they said they wanted to more than double the size of the IRS, just think about that. You know, there's about 80,000 people working at the IRS today. I have never gotten one phone call in my years in Congress of anybody asking me to add more people to the IRS. I get a lot of people saying we'd like more Border Patrol agents, but to say let's go from 80,000 to 167,000 IRS agents and allowing them to go after not the millionaires and the billionaires, it's going to be small business owners. It's going to be the single mom working two shifts at a restaurant. That's right. who they wanted to go after. We had an amendment, by the way, to say that those new agents couldn't go after those lower income families. And every Democrat voted against it because they want to generate billions of new taxes to spend on far left socialist items at the expense of these hardworking families. Enough is enough. We passed the bill. Not a single Democrat voted with us, but we passed it to the Senate. So call your senator if you want to say, hey, we don't need another 87,000 IRS agents. Maybe let's put those people over at the border, securing our border. Right. Call your senator because the bill's over there now. And Chuck Sumer said he doesn't want to bring it up. Call your senator and ask him to stand up and vote and bring that bill to the floor. Uh, again, another sharp contrast between the priorities of the two parties. Uh, Steve Scalise, I know you have to go. Uh, busy day for you. Thank you so much for taking time out. Looking forward to seeing this uh, conservative agenda advance in the House. And you know what? It'll, uh, it'll it's give a new day, Tony. It, God it bless is. America. And thanks for all you do to help promote having the changes that we finally got. Now let's go do the work fighting for those families who have been struggling for way too long. All right. Steve Scalise, thanks so much for being with us. God bless you. Now, it, 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 obviously, a lot of this legislation that uh, passes in the House is going to go in the Senate, and Chuck Schumer's not going to do anything. It's going to die over there. But this, again, it, it is showing the American people the priorities. I want you to think about this for just a moment. We're going to talk about it a little bit later when uh, South Carolina uh, Senator Lindsey Graham joins us. We're going to talk about the priorities of life in the Republican Party and, and more on the agenda coming through the House. But there's a priority for the Republican Party. It's in the platform. It is a, a, a top issue. And after years, obviously, almost wasn't always a, a, a an issue within the Republican Party. But with the election of Ronald Reagan back in the 80s, it became a, a an issue for the Republican Party, and they continue to advance it. And hey, here we are, almost 50 years after the Dob after the Roe decision, we had Dobbs. Now, what do we do to continue to build that culture of life? Well, the Republicans, you're going to see their priorities this week, beginning tomorrow on the life issue. All right, stick with us on the other side of the break. We're going to be joined by the former Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, going to talk about President Biden and his trip south. After two years of being president, he finally found the border. And uh, now he's meeting with the Mexican president. So will he adopt new policies that might solve the crisis at the border? Or, as we heard from his White House press secretary, are they just going to continue to blame Republicans? We're going to talk about that next. Don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead.
Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest and the trees. Welcome back. I'm Tony Perkins, and this is Washington Watch. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Lots of resources there for you. Be sure and check it out. President Biden met with uh, leadership from Mexico and Canada today at the North American Leaders Summit, part of a southern trip that included his first trip to the border after almost two years as president. And earlier today, the White House announced additional measures they say will prevent migrants from making the journey to the U.S. southern border. But given the unprecedented number of border crossings throughout the first two years of the Biden presidency, will the new measures lack the teeth? Will they have the teeth to curb illegal border crossings? Well, joining me now to discuss this and more is Chad Wolf. He is the former acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and now chairman for the Center of Homeland Security and Immigration at the American First Policy Institute. Chad, welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me. All right. So we talked before the president went down to the southern border and had his meetings down there and visited and talked to uh, those on the front lines. Uh, anything coming out of the president's trip that would suggest that he has grasped the significance of this crisis and is prepared to address it? Uh, no, I don't believe. I haven't I haven't seen nor heard, and I talked to a, a few folks down there in El Paso. I'm not sure that it's having much of an impact. His visit specifically on him. Look, all the all the photo ops and all the words are nice, but what it comes down to are, are actions. And at the end of the day, is the strategy going to change? because the president visited El Paso. I don't believe that it is, uh, but I think that's, you know, we've got to wait and see if, if anything changes. Uh, I think some of the, the op I think that trip mostly for the White House was more of an optics um, so that he could demonstrate to the American people he does care, even though I think that's questionable um, and that they could have some, some photos of him along that border. He has taken a lot of criticism, rightfully so, that not only in this administration, he's been president for two years, but actually in his whole entire political career, he's never been to the border, and so that he, he doesn't quite understand it. A two to three hour trip in El Paso is not going to solve that. It's not going to scratch that itch. Uh, but I think that was their goal at the end of the day. So, so Chad, you know, when we talk about the border, a lot of people, it gets wrapped up into the politics because there's yeah. clearly a political agenda here in terms of who comes into the country. But but I, I want to talk about the, the humanity of this. As you talked about the president wants to show that he cares. Well, there's, there's something very significant here to care about, and that is the unprecedented human trafficking that's taking yeah. place at our southern border. Many of these, uh, you know, helpless women, <clears throat> children being sex trafficked uh, and, and other inhumane, just vile things that are occurring and it is directly linked to our policy. 
A hundred percent. There's the trafficking. We've never seen a trafficking uh, experience that as we are today and what we're seeing on that border. And that's that's single adults. That's uh, men. That's women. That's children. It's across the board. Almost exclusively, whoever's coming across that border is either being trafficked or smuggled. And it's mainly by the cartels, almost exclusively by the cartels. And so when the numbers that you see are off the charts, uh, whether you look at them month by month or you look at them year over year, the numbers are off the charts. So uh, that means that the human trafficking is off the charts that we see down there. And I would just like to focus a little bit on the children, the unaccompanied children that we see down there. And, you know, there was a lot of criticism during the Trump administration, particularly during zero tolerance, when we talk about the number of children coming across that border, and it was, and it was several thousands at that time. The number of, of unaccompanied children coming across the border during the first two years of the Biden administration are over 300,000. That's 300,000 children that have crossed that border without a parent, without a guardian, without anyone they know, that have been trafficked or smuggled by cartel members. And that's the inhumane part of this strategy that no one seems to want to talk about. Biden administration will never talk about that. Uh, but they have these numbers. These are, in fact, their numbers. But it doesn't just stop there. Once these children come into the country, they are then transferred to health and human services to be placed somewhere with a with a parent or a guardian here in the United States. And the Biden administration has has taken steps to reduce the amount of vetting uh, that is done on those individuals, whether they are individuals that work at those HHHS facilities or it's the individuals picking these children up. They're no longer background checked. Uh, and the vetting has gone down under this administration. So, again, no one wants to talk about that. Right. But that's the inhumane situation that we're dealing with. It's it's immoral. It's dangerous. Uh, and, and it's all directly linked to the policies. Now, you talk about the cartels. The cartels, their coffers are running over with money because of this policy, because of the open borders. They're making billions of dollars carrying these people across the border. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, never in, the, in our history have, have the cartels controlled more money, more territory, and have more power than they do today. And it's not by happen chance, happenstance. Uh, it's not by just dumb luck. It's because of the policies of this administration. And why do I say that? I, to your point, Tony, um, when you have an open border and you allow the, the human trafficking that we see there, that directly enriches the cartels. There's not one individual that comes across that border that is smuggled or trafficked by a cartel member. And they pay anywhere from 6,000 upwards to 20,000, depending on where they come from around the globe uh, to cross that border. And so every month and every week that goes by where we're not trying to seal that border, where we're not trying to bring some, uh, bring those numbers down, the cartels are, are getting uh, rich beyond belief. And they put those illegal proceeds proceeds back into their business. And it is a multinational business that they have, whether it's trafficking more human beings, which is bad enough, or it's the illegal narcotics and the fentanyl that they are smuggling across that border and killing Americans every single day. So if we're getting serious, if we want to get serious about the cartels and we absolutely need to, it's something, you know, it starts with the border. It starts with um, shutting down uh, the, the cartel's criminal enterprise along that border. And so that means actually enforcing the law, uh, which we haven't seen, unfortunately, in two years. So we got 30 seconds left, but the president and his administration says this problem is here because of Republicans. Yeah, I hear this often. Um, and there's a Washington Post editorial, I think, just today that talks about, um, you know, Biden is having to act because Congress won't do its job which is completely false. Congress did not create this crisis. The Biden administration policies created this crisis. Uh, they need to solve it. It takes leadership, it takes will, it takes the ability to make some very difficult decisions. Uh, they're unwilling to do any of that and to simply say, well, it's Congress and it's specifically Republicans. There's been no uh, proposal that they have sent forward. In fact, what they have sent forward is amnesty. They right. want to provide amnesty to three million people, and somehow that's supposed to solve the crisis. No one has been able to explain that to me uh, because it's it's incomprehensible. Um, and so they're trying to they're trying to take a political issue and uh, capitalize off of it. Right, tells me they're not serious about addressing it. Chad right. Wolf, good to see you. Thanks so much for stopping right. today. Thank you. All right, folks, stick with us. More Washington Watch on the other side of this break.
All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. Leah Sherabu, a Christian teenager in Nigeria, remains a captive of Boko Haram for her refusal to renounce her Christian faith. Chinese pastor Wang Yi is serving a nine-year sentence for speaking publicly against the Chinese government. All of this because people in power decided different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Well, today is a big day in Arkansas. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was sworn in as governor. The legislature there gearing up to take on the left and their agenda. As radical transgender ad advocates continue their ongoing efforts to indoctrinate youth by occupying children's spaces, Arkansas state legislators have responded with a bill filed this week to define drag performances, these drag queen story hours, as an adult-oriented business, similar to adult nightclubs or pornographic theaters. If passed, the bill would also require that no adult-oriented business be located on public property or where a minor can view it. Well, joining me now to, uh, to discuss this is Arkansas State Representative Mary Bentley. She represents the 73rd District of Arkansas, and she's the author of the bill in the House. Representative Bentley, welcome to Washington Watch. Thank you, Tony. It's a delight to be here with you today. Well, we I have know. a wonderful day in Arkansas. We are really excited about our new governor and all that we've got moving forward. We've got a supermajority in the House and the Senate, so we're ge geared up for a wonderful session here in Arkansas. Well, I know it's a big night there. It was a big day. It's a big night. We've got celebrations tonight, so I thank you for taking out time to, uh, to join us to tell us about your bill. Now, uh, tell us, why did you introduce this bill, and what does it do? Well, Tony, uh, above all things, I'm a mom and a grandma, and I'm very concerned about what's happening to the children all across the state of Arkansas and across the nation. We are just uh, seeing children that are suffering greatly. We see children that are addicted to uh, drugs. We see children that are doing suicide. We see uh, transgender youth just rising, skyrocketing across the nation. So we're very concerned about our kids. We used to protect the innocence of our children. We used to treasure the innocence of our children, but uh, the left has pushed so far that we are just ready. Enough is enough. We're ready to push back and protect the innocence of our children and put children first here in Arkansas. It's really the bill is a very simple bill just to list them as sexually oriented businesses and keep uh, transgender uh, the drag queen shows away from our kids. So this has been a big deal all across the country. They've been pushing this into libraries. <laughs> They've been uh, indoctrinating our children. And, and also, it's not just the children. They're trying to normalize this abnormal behavior and it, and it is controversial I, I imagine you've gotten some pushback for introducing this bill uh, a little bit but mostly i've gotten praise from my constituents i'm in a very conservative area i just recently went through a pretty tough primary and so i heard everywhere i went that that my constituents are very concerned about what's happening to our kids and most i've heard just great things from my constituents thanking us for just saying enough is enough and putting forth some common sense legislation to change things here in our state and protect our children so how optimistic are you that this can make its way through the legislature? I mean, Mary, you said you've got uh, super majorities there in the legislature, mm -hmm. so you've got some good ground to work with. 
What do you what do you think the prospects are for this bill? I think we've got great chances of passing this bill here. We've, we're going to start in the Senate. My, my colleague, Senator Gary Stubblefield, is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee over there, and he wanted to start it on the Senate end to give it a good start. We've got a bunch of new members in the House, strong conservative members. I'm reaching out across the state to our uh, Republican committee members to say to reach out to your legislators. Let them know how you're feeling. This is the things that we hear across the state that people want. So now's the time for the grassroots to rise up. Let the legislators know that they support it and get ready for a good session. I feel very optimistic about this bill. Well, uh, you've got a lot to work with there in Arkansas. We're, we've worked there quite a bit. We've, we've seen the SAFE Act pass there. Uh, looks like you've got a very, very exciting session ahead where you're going to pass some significant legislation to protect children and uh, protect those values that make America strong. Exactly right. We've seen, you know, our just all of our values have been attacked for years and we have not pushed back anywhere near like we should have. So with the overturn of Roe, we were able to you know, pass the trigger bill here. And so we've ended abortion here in Arkansas. It's just to me, it's a great impetus to move forward and let's protect all our kids and move forward with our strong conservative values that made this nation great, that made it what it is today. So we've got to, protect. I have six wonderful grandchildren. I want our, our state to be here moving strong, moving forward for those kids and for all the kids across this nation. I'm just very excited about what Arkansas is gonna be able to do. Well, Representative Mary Bentley, we're going to be watching it very closely, and we'll uh, we'll keep track of it. Look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Keep us in our prayer. Keep us in your prayers. I really appreciate it, Tony, and all that you're doing. We really appreciate you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Arkansas State Representative Mary Bentley. You know, this is another example of how elections have consequences. All right, you get involved and you elect conservatives, and here now in Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee. Uh, Sanders is the governor. You've got super majorities in the House and in the Senate. Now, it, it's pretty it's pretty conservative. As I mentioned, the SAFE Act, that's, the, that's to protect children from these experimental surgeries and drug treatments in the whole transgender craze that's been going on. They passed it there. Now, the former governor vetoed it, but they overrode his veto. This is going to be encouraging uh, to see like Arkansas and some of these conservative states to advance these important pieces of legislation that, as Mary said, push back on the left. We, we've allowed them to run with this stuff too long. Other states need to pick it up and run with it. But we've got to have the men and women in office at the state level that are willing to take these things on. And maybe you're one of those that need Maybe you need to run for office. Maybe you're being called to run for the school board. We saw a lot of folks elected to the school boards in this last election. State legislature is just important. I know a lot of focus is always here in Washington on, on Congress. I tell you, as a former state legislator, the real action is at the state level. That's where you can really change things. And don't think it's just limited to your own borders. I, I did a number of pieces of legislation that got picked up in other states. They're always looking for ideas. And that's one of the reasons I have representatives like um, Mary Bentley on, because I want to kind of seed the minds of other legislators or constituents to reach out to their legislators and give them ideas. All right. Coming up next, Senator Lindsey Graham returns to Washington Watch to preview pro-life legislation that he'll support. And we'll talk about more with him after the break. Stay tuned. More Washington Watch straight ahead. It begins here, and here, and here, every day. Before you stand, you need solid ground. Standing in a culture that wants you to surrender the truth won't work unless you have a firm foundation. At Family Research Council, we have that firm foundation, and you can find us standing. We stand for the value of all human life, we stand for the right of families to flourish. And every day we stand for your freedom to believe and to live out those beliefs both at home and abroad. We work with government officials, educating them on the issues from a biblical worldview. And when necessary, we hold them accountable. We equip Christians across America to be informed and to take action in their communities. With our daily radio program, television appearances, and vast online presence, we reach people where they are. 
We envision an America where all human life is valued, families flourish, and religious liberty thrives. That won't be realized if we're not standing. Stand for faith. Stand for family. Stand for freedom. Stand with us at FRC. King David wrote of God's word as a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is a timeless truth. For those through the centuries that have embraced this truth, they have found the Word of God provides a solid foundation for life. That's why the Family Research Council has embarked upon a two-year chronological Bible reading plan called Stand on the Word. We've made it easy for you to read through the Bible in two years by taking just 10 to 15 minutes, six days a week. And to encourage you on the journey, I have a brief eight to 10 minute devotional each morning, Monday through Friday, that accompanies the reading. You can join me by going to frc.org slash Bible. That's frc.org slash Bible. Or you can join me on my Facebook page, Tony Perkins, each morning at 844 Eastern Time. Again, the website, frc.org slash Bible, or on Facebook at Tony Perkins. Join us, and together we will stand on the Word. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday. The website, TonyPerkins.com. And uh, let me remind you of the petition that we have to CVS and Walgreens. Now, we talked about this extensively last week. I mentioned it yesterday. The FDA changing the rules so that uh, pharmacies can now sell the abortion pill. All right, sell it right there. Essentially turning the neighborhood pharmacy into an abortion facility. This these rules, uh, this change in the rules was not approved by the, there was no public input in this. This is something unilaterally that the Biden administration did. Of course, they've been pushing abortion. This is their response to Dobbs. They want to make sure that, you know, there's an abortion center on almost every corner. So uh, Walgreens and CVS have already indicated, they publicly stated that they're going to get the certification they need, which is essentially, I guess, just getting approved by the FDA to sell this uh, life-destroying drug. So contact CVS and Walgreens, and we can make that easy for you. Simply text the word pharmacy, that's P-H-A-R-M-A-C-Y, pharmacy, to 67742. You'll get a link. You can follow the link over and sign the petition. So as I mentioned earlier in the program, the House of Representatives uh, planned to use their new majority to launch a full-scale pro-life offensive against the Biden administration's radical abortion policies. Among the bills discussed include the abortion, uh, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. Now, this is one that I mentioned before it has been blocked over 80 times by the Democrats. Nancy Pelosi refused 80 times to allow this bill to come to the floor. Now, there's more measures coming forward in the days ahead. No taxpayer funding for abortion, the Heartbeat Protection Act, and the Save Moms and Babies Act, which would help stop the interstate flow of chemical abortion drugs. Now, they're also advancing a resolution that expresses a sense of Congress condemning the recent attacks on pro-life facilities, groups, and churches, which we've documented here at the Family Research Council. Well, as Republicans bring these life-saving initiatives to a vote in the House, they will have no stronger ally on the Senate side than my next guest, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham. Uh, he serves on four committees, including the Senate Budget Committee, where he's the ranking member, as well as the Senate Judiciary Committee. And he joins me now by phone. Senator Graham, welcome back to the program. All right, thank you, Tony. Happy New Year. Well, speaking of life, a little disappointing news from your home state of South Carolina, where the state Supreme Court there decided... Uh, to ban the yeah. fetal heartbeat bill. Your reaction to that? Uh, it won't stand. It was a, a, a really bizarre interpretation of the 
right to privacy uh, uh, provision of the South Carolina Constitution that was inserted in the Constitution in 1971 when abortion was banned. Uh, you know, Roe didn't come out to 1973. So I think uh, there are three judges out of the five. Uh, I think it's going to reverse itself pretty soon. Uh, there'll be a judicial opening here. Uh, one of the judges that was in the uh, the three is going to retire, and I'm confident that the uh, state house. We have one of the most pro-life governors in the country, Henry McMaster. Have one of the best pro-life legislative bodies, House and Senate. So this will not stand. It will take a bit of time, but I think the uh, the courts, uh, the decision will not stand. Now. Running up to the this past election, this midterm election, you uh, introduced once again a pain bill, which uh, this is a point in which babies feel pain. And after that point, right. at 15 weeks, abortion, uh, there would be a federal ban on abortion. Uh, you know, there was it, it was kind of like uh, I was describing this to conservatives today, talking about what happened going into the election. I, I don't think Republicans were prepared for the success that came <laughs> through Dobbs, but yeah. You step forward with this consensus measure that gave Republicans something to work with in terms of showing who was extreme on the issue of abortion. You know, God bless you and, and you know, Marjorie at the SBA and a few others. It was pretty lonely, to be honest with you. So after Dobbs, uh, the Democrats introduce and we vote uh, on the floor of the Senate on a taxpayer-funded abortion bill up to the moment of birth. The exceptions were a joke. This was taxpayer-funded abortion, really right up through the tr third trimester, and every Democrat voted for it. And I thought, okay, this is the most extreme position. Uh, this is North Korea and China. Let's let's get into the fight here. So I introduced the pain-capable bill. Uh, we know at 15 weeks the child can feel pain, and you know there was a lot of uh, sitting on the sidelines on the Republican side. So you were great. So I'm going to do this again. I'm not going to surrender Washington, D.C. to the radical Democratic left. I'm going to keep introducing my bill to have a national minimum standard, and my bill allows states to be more restrictive. The Democrats want to wipe out every pro-life protection uh, that exists by a national standard, taxpayer-funded, up to the moment of birth. This is a cause worth fighting for. They're the extremists, not us, and I appreciate your support and your prayers. Earlier in the program, I was talking with uh, the new majority leader in the House, Steve Scalise, we were discussing, and a longtime friend, he and I served together in Louisiana. The, the, the House is moving forward with pro-life legislation. This is one of those areas of clear contrast between the two parties. In fact, it's never been a sharper contrast in, in my time, in almost a quarter of a, actually longer than a quarter of a century in politics. Um, speaking of helpful, the RNC, uh, Ronna McDaniel, has been very helpful on communicating oh God, on this yeah. issue as well. Talk about the difference between the two parties and, and why this is a defining issue. Okay, I think it's a defining moment for the pro-life movement. There are people who are saying that abortion should be a state issue. No, it is a human rights issue. I don't want to be like China and North Korea that allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth. Ronald McDaniel filled the vacuum in very quickly. She was uh, the chairman of the RNC. She spoke out loudly and clearly that the Republican Party should offer an alternative to taxpayer-funded abortion up to the moment of birth. A 15-week pain-capable bill, bill puts us in line with a civilized world, and she was there when I needed her the most. Here's what I'll predict. In the coming years here, and it takes a while, remember partial birth abortion took about 10 years. This is a debate that we need to have and is worth worth having. I believe the American public, people, are going to soundly reject taxpayer-funded abortion all the way up to the moment of birth is extremely radical and out of sync with the character of the American people. I think a 15-week national minimum standard that allows states to do more is eminently reasonable, and maybe one day we can do better than that. It is a fight worth having. It is a contrast worth having. And I'm telling my Republican colleagues who are running in 2024, if you can't label the Democratic Party extreme on this, you're not very good.
I, I want to go back to something you said a moment ago about how when the Dobbs decision was handed down, Roe was overturned, I mean, 49 years after the fact, right. something that Republicans have had in their party platform for a long time. I mean, this is not a new issue. It's been around for, as I mentioned, Ronald Reagan really made it a mainstream Republican issue. Why? Why were so many Republicans content to stand on the sideline or why were they voiceless? Well, you know, Roe made it all kind of talk. You know, Roe was, you know, prevented uh, states and the federal government from acting, uh, except in very very narrow areas. When Dobbs overruled Roe, which it should have, you know, that was a great decision by the Supreme Court, a very good pro-life court. The Republican Party was not ready. And let me just say this. The Democratic Party, as much as I disagree with them, uh, are all in on the abortion issue. They're mm -hmm. all in for taking your money, taxpayer dollars, to allow abortion up to the moment of birth as a national policy, overriding every state uh, pro-life law on the books. That is their position. They did not hesitate. They brought the bill to the floor, and uh, every Democrat voted for it. And I'm going to tell you right now, my friend, that if we fight back and we inform the public of what they want to do, make America like North Korea and China, we will win on this issue. But it takes us fighting back. And Ronald McDaniel was a strong voice with inside the Republican um, um, leadership. You were great. Uh, I, I had a hard time, quite frankly, getting my Republican colleagues to sign up. There's a narrative out there that I totally reject, that somehow the abortion issue hurts Republicans. Right. I don't buy that. I, I agree. And I think this election cycle was an anomaly. And it was only because too many Republicans were silent. It was kind of like the dog that caught the car, didn't know what to do once they got it. We had Roe overturned, and as you said, really had not thought through that scenario. And there were a few that were able to step forward and, and talk through this. But here was part of the problem, and you and I talked about this um, previously on the program, is that, you know, the 15-week ban or the pain ban is not my preferred. I, I want to, I'm pro-life from the moment of conception. You've talked yeah, no, about I that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But... This is a point of consensus. And so just as I uh, did back when I was in office, I, I started a point in past legislation where you can get consensus and you can work your way forward. And that's how I think we got to the point of Dobbs, is that we built consensus across the country step by step. And, and I think that's what you're suggesting is the way forward from here. Yeah, I, okay, I can't really say it any better. Okay, I'm in the Senate. We gotta get 60 votes, right? We. Uh, it was my bill with Mike DeWine, the Lacey Peterson uh, Victims of Unborn Violence bill, that got 72 votes. What did it do? If you cause harm to a pregnant woman on federal property and the baby is damaged um, or dies, you can be charged with two crimes, not one. That took about a decade. So partial birth abortion took about 12 to 14 years. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think. If we can get the American people to think nationally, okay, what do we want to be like as a nation when it comes to the rights of the unborn? Do we want to be like China and North Korea, or do we want to be in the mainstream of the world where 50 of 53 European countries have a national standard at 15 weeks or below? The key to my bill, and I want people to understand this, yes, I'd like to do more, but my bill allows states to do more. The democratic approach destroys every state pro-life protection at the state level. Right. So I'm giving cover. To do more in those states where we can. You're, you're just setting time, a minimum. Do, you're setting a minimum, a minimum the states can do. Absolutely. The states can go more. as far as they can build consensus to do in those states. Absolutely. And maybe we can do more in Washington. But here's the worst possible outcome for the pro-life movement. To say that there's no voice in Washington for the right. unborn. Right. To surrender the nation's capital to the radical Agreed. left when it comes to the pro-life movement. It is a human right issue. It doesn't matter where you're conceived. At 15 weeks, whether you're in California or New York, abortion at, a, at that point in, in the birthing process is dismembering a, a developing child in a most barbaric way. Uh, Senator, I'm going to get you to respond. We're almost out of time, but I want you to respond to this as well. The, the House this week is going to be uh, passing a concurrent resolution, just expressing the sense of the Congress condemning the recent attacks on pro-life facilities, groups, and, and churches. We documented that. We put out a publication recently on that. 
the Department of Justice, you're on the Judiciary Committee, the Department of Justice, yeah. they've done nothing on over 80 attacks. They've done nothing when it comes to the attacks of pro-life uh, organizations and churches, but yet they're out there arresting pro-life advocates under the FACE Act. What's going on? Well, what's going on is a double standard. Okay, you got classified information apparently in Joe Biden's library. Does anybody say anything about that? So we live in we live in a two tiered system. You, you you've got social media companies suppressing uh, derogatory information about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden right before the election. Now you got the Department of Justice that's using the power of the law in a one sided way. Here's the radical left's approach. The unborn child is actually the enemy. I mean, the obsession they have with making sure that there are no protections for a developing child uh, is barbaric. The American people, the further along in the birthing process, the American people reject late-term abortions. I think they will reject dismembering a baby who can feel pain at 15 weeks. I think they want to be in the mainstream of the world. So this idea where you you allow the the attack on a pro-life uh, institution to go unpunished just shows you how radical they've become on the issue of the right of the unborn. How do we fix this? You win elections. How did we overturn Roe, okay? We overturned Roe by staying in the fight, getting congressional majorities, God bless President Trump and, and Bush and all those who nominated conservative folks. And senators who worked to get this, them confirmed, like Lindsey Graham yeah, and, and, and others. Everybody that I'm talking to on this that is listening knocked on doors and made phone calls. Well, now, how do you win? You have a fight. You have a contest. You're not a physical fight. You have a contest of ideas. Here's what I think will happen. If I keep pushing my bill, a 15-week, pain-capable, national minimum standard, you can do more at the state level if you can find consensus. We will win the argument. Yeah. How do you win? You win elections, but you've got to engage the other side. Right. If we surrender in Washington, that's the end of the pro-life movement, and I will never buy into the idea the pro-life movement is a state's rights issue. It is a human rights issue all over this country. Agreed. Agreed. Senator Lindsey Graham, we're out of time. Always great to talk with you. The next time, next time, we're going to talk foreign policy. All right? All right, pal. Thanks. All right. Good to talk to you. Senator Lindsey Graham of uh, South Carolina, once again, advancing the li his life measure, the pain bill in the Senate. Look, again, it's the incremental approach, building consensus. And I know this drives the left crazy, but you build consensus, then you can move further. I mean, we got to this point, overturning Roe by building consensus one step at a time. We cannot, and I, I appreciate Lindsey Graham saying we will not give up this ground here in Washington, D.C. All right, folks, out of time for tonight. Join us this evening for a special edition of Pray, Vote, Stand. Tune in at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, prayvotestand.org. Special guests are going to be there with us. Until next time, I leave you once again with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6. Look it up. Keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.